<laughs> you go in the middle. I go in the middle. Ah, it's a centrist. Uh, uh, true centrist. Here we go. All right. I'm going to fight you for that chair, Okay, but... <laughs> okay no fighting. Okay. Um, it is great to be here with you guys. Um, two of the smartest and most quotable people in the state of Israel. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, and welcome, everybody. I, we can't see you, That's so um, we have yeah. no idea if there's 7,000 people here or seven people, which is probably good. Right. Yes. Um, anyway, so I want to start with what seems like kind of the obvious question, but really the biggest question. So you've titled this book Israel 2048, or I guess it's just called 2048, The Rejuvenated State. And, you know, we've just celebrated the 75th anniversary, and a lot of smart people have been asking if it's going to make it to 100. Uh, will there be a Jewish and democratic state in the land um, in 2048 or not? And people are noting, uh, you both are historians, of, mm. uh, that you know, there have been other times when Jews have controlled Jerusalem and the land, and they have not lasted 100 right. years. So I guess, and in the book, um, Ambassador Oren, you say, by all measures, the state should have dissolved years ago. True. We never should have made it this far. So, I would love for each of you, and we'll start with you um, uh, as the author of this book, um, to kind of lay the odds for us. Like, what's the chance that uh, we're back here in 25 years having a, a centenary celebration, um, again, of Israel surviving as a Jewish and democratic state, presuming you think it is one right now? And um, <laughs> what's going to need to happen to make, to make uh, that, re that a reality? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Opening it's an question. easy one. An easy one. <laughs> Softball question. Softball. First of all, Jody, thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you to the incomparable uh, Susan Engel for making this happen, uh, for Tammy for making everything happen. Uh, ben, my son, Noam, everybody in the audience, my sister um, is here. Thank you, everyone who was not at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> um, the assumption of this book was that Israel had, so far, a not just successful 75 years, but an outstandingly successful uh, 75 years, because by any international criteria, Israel is not a successful country. Is is was a miraculous country, you know. Whether it's been in terms of you know, average longevity, and if you're an American Jewish male or American male, you want to live eight years longer, you move to Israel. Um, you in terms of education levels. Um, the fact that the, the water that comes out of your tap you can, is better than anything you get in a bottle, that kind of thing, um, infrastructure. But much of that success owed to the discussions that occurred within the Jewish world for the 60 years before Israel was created, from the 1880s to the 1940s. And as much as by the power of the, the sword, that state was created by, by the strength of words, by these discussions. And many of the institutions that have made, have contributed to the success, like our universal health care system, our university system, were the products of these discussions. And uh, somewhere along the line, I, I know you're going to agree with me on that, sometimes we've lost the ability to think about our future. We're so bogged down in our, our daily uh, controversies and to have that type of open discussion. And we face many challenges. We're going to talk about a lot about what's happening in Israel politically with the, the reforms, the democracy movement. Um, but beyond that, there is the question of the ultra-Orthodox community. There is the question of the Bedouin in the south. Um, there is the deep, deep um, economic divide with a million children beneath the poverty level in Israel. The largest, by the way, social divide of any country in the world outside the United States, Chile, and Mexico. There are grave challenges facing the state of Israel. If we don't acknowledge them now and understand them now, and to begin to act on them now, then to answer your question, Jody, not only can we not be assured of, say, a second successful century, after 2048, but we don't know if we're actually going to make that 2048 in the same way. And, um, you know, I'm an optimist. I don't think you can be an historian of Israel and not be optimistic. And even to have the experiences that we have had since moving to Israel, now well, I'm 45 years in Israel, you know, whether it be seeing a million Jews coming from the former Soviet Union, to see Israel opened up to the world, relations with China. And India, the peace process. When I moved to Israel, there was no peace with Jordan and Egypt, much less the, the, uh, the Abraham Accord countries. To see these things, to see, okay, miracles are possible, but we can't rely on miracles. We have to be proactive, and we have to understand. Because the 
all mobilization is predicated, first of all, on, on awareness. And that's what this book is about. I mean, there's a lot of good statistics in the book. I would commend them to you. Um, some like surprising and including some of those OECD statistics that you kind of uh, referenced. But if you zoom out from that, you know, you just talked about Israel as this wildly successful country, and it doesn't feel that way right now. So, um, Yossi, I'll... I'm not sure what country does, but okay. <laughs> but I'll ask you to, to yeah. pick up, Yossi, and about yeah. how, how, it, how it feels to you. I know you've been, you know, quite engaged in the protest movement and deeply concerned about what's going on. So, how do you, what, what, what's, what's the chance that we make it to 2048? What has to happen? So, well, first of all, I, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be doing this with you, Michael, and, and Jody, how much I appreciate your, your, your doing this with us. Um, this, for me, is, is repaying a kind of karmic debt. <laughs> Ten years ago, uh, Ten years ago. Uh, Michael joined me in the release of, uh, of a book that I had published in October uh, 2013, and, uh, and now here we are. Uh, with 2048. Just the title itself gives me pause. <laughs> you know, really? That's, that's, it's a statement of faith and optimism, as is, as is the fact that uh, what you have in this book are three languages in one cover. Uh, it's in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. And I don't know of any other book that has done that. And uh, that in itself is a, is a statement and a vision. For Which also means it's quite short. Um, it's only a third of the size, whichever language you're reading it. So it's really, a, I discovered this while I was yeah. reading it on the plane home. It was quite um, exciting to discover. So it's quite short. And I just want to practice you, your Arabic. Before you yeah. continue, Yossi, yeah. I just want to say yeah. the book Yossi is talking about is uh, Like Dreamers. His history, uh, he traces the history of Israel through the paratroopers who uh, liberated or whatever verb you might want to use, the Western Wall in 1967. And it is Brilliant. So I want to commend that book to you, but I'll let you Thank continue. You. Now. Thank you. It's, a, it's about 50 times longer, longer than this book. <laughs> so, it is a so, lot longer. So read this. Read this. <laughs> and it's got a happy <laughs> ending. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Uh, look, you know, I, um, I, I hear you, Michael, and I obviously a part of me feels that as well. And a part of me is permanently celebratory. For, for, for what we've achieved. But in the last months, uh, what has, what the, the emotion that is strongest for me is, uh, is dread. And we all, we all, Jews carry this fear of ourselves, of our self-destructive potential. It's built into our DNA. This, the story that we have told ourselves for 2,000 years of how we ended up in exile was it was our own fault. We, never, we didn't blame the Romans. The Romans were this kind of indifferent storm. We were the ones who, who destroyed ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we, we carry in, in, in us this, this fear of ourselves, of our own self-destructive potential. Mm. And this is a moment in Israel where, you know, it's like things were going too well for the Jewish people. You know, we were, we startup nation, you know, we, one immigration wave after another. Israel had, fine, we were finally getting used to the idea of our own permanence. It took many, many years for me to settle into the, the radical idea that I don't have to fear the, 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 for the physical existence of Israel. This is, this is a breakthrough analysis of politics. The whole Israeli politics can basically be explained by two Jews, three synagogues. No, it, it's not. We have a national book. Most national books have Ulysses, Gilgamesh, you know, historic, they're books of triumph. Our national book is a book of defeat. Yes. Um, yes. Spiritual failure. Everything, you know. Yeah. We blew it twice. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are we going to blow it, blow it a third time? And that's, that's, that's the fear that I've been carrying these last months. Mm. And you feel it on the streets. The, the, the demonstrations are really, on the one hand, <clears throat> some of the most uplifting Israeli experiences that I've had, where you feel you're surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people who care desperately for Israel, who love Israel, who would do anything to protect Israel. And, and this feeling that, that I certainly have had and, and, and many of my friends have had, 
that this is a kind of civilian equivalent of reserve duty. We're, we're, we're defending the, the long-term viability of Israel. Modern, successful startup nation, the Israel that you were just describing, is under existential threat from within. And that's what makes this moment so terrifying. Mm. It's very different than with the, the protests we knew in the 60s, because we're both product of the same uh, era in American politics, where people would get out and burn American flags and spit at soldiers and call America with a K. Uh, these protests are protests out of love. There's immense outpouring of love. People the, singing Hatikva. And the symbol of yeah. the protest movement is the Israeli, Israeli flag. flag. You know, yeah, here, that's extraordinary. Here, yeah. if you would have an opposi a liberal opposition movement, mm -hmm. there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be thousands of American flags flying, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm which is really a problem when one side of the political debate appropriates the national flag. Right. And in Israel, it belongs, belongs to all of us. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the meat of this controversy, these protests, the judicial reform, the judicial overhaul, the, <clears throat> some call it anti-democratic um, legislation. You wrote this book in 2020, I think, right? Thereabouts, yeah. And it includes a chapter called Judges in Jerusalem, where you say that you that there's a real problem with the judicial independence question, mm -hmm. um, and you call for two big changes. One is a change in how judges are selected, Indeed. Um, and the other is a change in the Supreme Court's ability to review legislation passed by the Knesset. Uh, the scope, it's, it's not, not necessarily has to do with the Knesset, it has to do with, let, let me explain. Let me we take two steps back. Why did I write this in 2020? I was working on this in Knesset. I was working on judicial reform in Knesset. Most people here are citizens of the United States. You have not one, but two opportunities to influence the composition of your three Supreme Court. You vote for the president, you vote for the Senate. Um, we in Israel have virtually no say about the composition of our Supreme Court, and that is why, in contrast to the United States, where the composition of the Supreme Court is a major electoral issue every time, uh, in Israel it's never, no one ever asks. It's not an issue. And that is because the Supreme Court judges are chosen by a committee of nine, and on that committee of nine, the majority of the, of the vote in that committee of nine are either sitting jurists in the Supreme Court or other legal personnel. Uh, and as wonderful as our jurists are, uh, they're also human beings, and quite naturally, if you're going to choose your successor, you're going to choose somebody who agrees with you, not someone who disagrees with you. And so in terms of its worldview, the Supreme Court was sort of marching in place circa 1994. The Knesset, as you knew, moved, moved very far to the right, reflecting shifts in Israeli public opinion. And so the distance between them grew and grew and grew and became untenable. And increasingly, the Supreme Court was overturning pieces of legislation by the Knesset. And people in the Knesset were saying, well, we're going to pass an override law, which says that with 61 members of Knesset, which is the smallest majority you can have, we're going to override a ruling of the Supreme Court, in which case that's the end of judicial review, which I strongly believe is the pillar of any democratic society in the world, including this country. How do you then reform the Supreme Court in a way that preserves judicial review? And one was you change the way judges are are uh, chosen, that better reflects. I did not recommend that we adopt the American uh, position entirely because we have to preserve, because Israel is such a highly diversified society, we have to make sure there's an Arab judge or a Haredi judge, ultra-Orthodox judge. You can't do that if the Knesset is choosing all the, the people. So I did a divide in the thing. The 15 judges, eight are chosen by the government, seven chosen by independent committee. Limiting the scope, um, the Israeli Supreme Court has the widest uh, jurisdiction of any Supreme Court in the world. It operates under the notion that everything is adjudicable, a court shafit, which means like the position of this bottle on the table can be determined by the Supreme Court. And that was, that was also uh, untenable. So you have to limit the jurisdiction. None of this, by the way, was insurmountable. It, these, are, these are simple solutions to a complex question, but it was a matter of political will and political maneuverability, and that's the big question whether uh, in the negotiations now being held under the auspices of the, of the president, whether these parties can actually agree to these type of compromises. Um, I mean, I guess the question is how did, mm. what, what you're describing sounds kind of reasonable-ish. Um, <laughs> you know, we all, we grew up learning whether from, you know, conjunction, junction, whatever, we learn about checks and balances and we, yeah. we hold them quite dear. And most of us have learned about this judicial reform as, as the demise of checks and balances or the demise of separate separation of branches of government. So how did we get from what you're describing sounds kind of reasonable to what feels 
to Yossi and hundreds of thousands of people on the streets and many American Jews like an assault on democracy. Um, and I guess, Yossi, I'd ask you, like, is what Michael's saying in this book and now, like, is it reasonable? And, ha and what happened? Because Well, it it's seems really like interesting because uh, Michael and I argue about these issues literally every day. I think that's <laughs> fair to say, right? right. And uh, my closest friend and, and, uh, and my sparring partner. And, uh, and here we are on a stage. And, it's, and I, I have to kind of do a switch. No, no, it's good, it's good, so, uh, uh, it's good TV to spar right, and disagree. Right. <laughs> so, um, look, I agree with you that there, there needs to be uh, some adjustment. That's, that's the delicate word yeah. I would use. And the reason I'm using such a cautious word uh, is uh, several fold. First of all, because we don't have a constitution, we only have one parliamentary house. Uh, this is what we have. We have the Supreme Court to balance the, the, the power of the politicians. The threats to Israeli democracy, even leaving this government aside for a moment, are, are profound. They're, they're, they're systemic. First of all, we have a, a, an occupation that's going on for more than half a century. And you and I agree uh, that this occupation is a disaster for Israel and that we have no choice but to continue the occupation for the foreseeable future for security reasons, because we don't have a credible Palestinian partner, all the reasons that, that are, have been discussed for years, and, and you and I agree with that. Nevertheless, the, the ongoing occupation, to my mind, necessitates an activist Supreme Court. We need a strong, liberal, activist, interventionist court for that reason. The second reason is the overwhelming security threats that we face. There's no other country, well, maybe now except for Ukraine, that, uh, that faces the kinds of existential threats that we routinely deal with. And, and in, inevitably, that, that weakens democratic norms. And I think, I think the miracle of Israeli democracy is that we're, we're struggling to, to maintain democratic norms in the middle of, of, of the kinds of threats that would have destroyed democracies for other countries. Nevertheless, we are facing ongoing threats to, 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 to democratic norms. Uh, and the final, the final threat to democracy is uh, here, here I, I, I'd be careful about using the word threat, but the strain on democracy is the fact that Israel was founded not as a state of its citizens. It was founded to deal with the problems of a world people. The Jewish people, and uh, and I believe that that being a, a the state of all of its citizens is compatible with being a Jewish state. But there's a strain, there's a constant tension in these two identities. And so when you when you put all of these issues together, for me, I I I, I can't imagine what we would be like with a weaker court. Now that's before we even get. To but this it's government. not a weaker court, it's a more circumscribed court, now, not okay. a weaker one. Okay. okay, so and where I do agree with you yeah. is that the court lost substantial amount of credibility uh, within large parts of the Israeli public, and that's very dangerous for democracy. Yeah. So yes, we, we have the same problem here. And so, okay. Yeah, we'll believe, so, we're going to get to here. <laughs> we're, we're, but okay, so it's all going to sound very familiar so to you. So good, we need, we need yeah. an adjustment, reform, call it what, what you will. Mm -hmm. What we're facing here is not a reform, it's a revolution. And, and I believe that it is only our protests that stop the government from doing the, the, mm -hmm. the outrage of the, the, the judicial override which would have destroyed yeah. Israeli democracy. I, I don't disagree with the word he said, understand. What a deep concern I have, and maybe you're gonna disagree with me on this, is the, what I call the Americanization of Israeli politics, which has been you know, a growing sense among segments of the Israeli population that the outcome of the election is not acceptable. Uh, they're not, legit, legitimate, le, uh, not legitimate elections. The government is not legitimate. Um, cancel culture, not letting people speak. And it's interesting, it's coming from different segments. In this country, the, you know, the assault on the Supreme Court, the criticism of the Supreme Court, uh, comes uh, from the left, and in, in, in Israel it has come from the right. 
Uh, it's almost like mirror images of one another, what's mm -hmm. going on here. The cancel culture in, 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 in Israel is coming from different places too. And I'm, I, I, we have not had an insurrection. Okay, with them in 75 years. We're yeah. one of, I always say this. Yeah, yes. we say yes. Yeah, it's true. Um, we're closer than we've been. I mean, we, 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 we should, we should just give fired. the state of Israel a little credit. We are one of maybe the five countries in the world that have never known a second of non democratic governance. Okay? We're the only country in that list that's never known a second of peace, but we've never had a, a coup or attempted coup. We've never had a contested election. All right? We haven't had people saying we're not going to accept the government, and some of those governments were very controversial. We had, it, we had, no, we had In the last year and a half, we had un, the, the, until the, now. The, no, we, no, the Lapid, the, the, the Bennett Lapid government was considered illegitimate by I the right. Told, that's my point. You're Netanyahu, making like, it yeah, started okay. now. It Netanyahu, started actually with, with, with the Likud saying that Bennett yeah. wasn't a legitimate prime right. minister. I agree Netanyahu with you. Said, we don't disagree. Netanyahu said, said this. This the Bennett government is legal and not legitimate, which is mm -hmm. what I would it's how I would describe this government of Ben Greer and Smotrich. And, uh, okay, I want to. It's I, scary. Mm -hmm. A couple things. I, can I call you Michael? If I have to call you what, would, what would you think? I don't about? know. Uh, high honor. I'm whatever. partial to Doug. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, what? <laughs> so you, Michael, yes. referred very casually to these negotiations that are going on under the president's auspices, yes. President Herzog. Which, as though there are real negotiations going on that are going to yield some kind of compromise, which I feel is, that is not my, I mean, that's the first time I feel like I've heard them referred to seriously, and I'm wondering if that was accidental or on purpose and what you think, um, Yossi, as to whether, are, are there real negotiations that going on that you think are going to yield some reasonable compromise here, or is this basic hardline proposal, mass protests in the street going to continue until there's some kind of crisis that causes yet another election? These, these negotiations remind me of the Oslo process. Where, um, which brought us peace. So which which brought us peace in our time. And, and the, the Oslo process was, was doomed from the beginning. You know, there's, there's the, this a kind of a left-wing revisionist idea of why Oslo failed, which is that Rabin was assassinated, and if he had lived, Oslo would have succeeded. Not true. Absolutely not, not true. true. I, don't, I don't know anyone in Israel, virtually, who believes that. And, and we chose the wrong negotiating partner. There never was a chance. And that's how I feel about, about this government. I'll say Lahavdil, for those who understand the, 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 ling, the lingo. I will say Lahavdil. I don't want to compare. Netanyahu to Arafat, but in terms of the chances of a negotiation of, an, of the negotiation succeeding, this government has has about as as much goodwill on this issue as Yasser Arafat had in making peace with Israel. That's that's where I would make the comparison. So, so there's no chance. For so my, I, I, and I, I hope I hope Michael you'll. You'll be in a position to tell me, I told you so. You're pessimistic. <laughs> You're always pessimistic. I, I, I really hope yeah. you'll, you'll be right. No, actually more pessimistic than you are um, on this one, and I'll explain why. Um, I come also from the world of politics, and you know, a little bit, unfortunately, know how hot dogs are made. And um, <laughs> I had a great guru once upon a time, Asher Aryan. Remember him? Yes. He was like the first yes. Israeli scholar of Israeli politics, an American. And he's, he's passed away. And I once asked him, I said, OK, on one foot, tell me, what is the one law of Israeli politics I have to know? And he said this, Israeli politicians will always prefer collective to individual suicide. <laughs> and believe me, and we'll burn the whole place down. If I'm not going to get it, I'll burn the whole place down. And it's not just the government that is unwilling to compromise at these things. It's also the opposition, which has actually no interest in compromising because they're doing well by not compromising. Right. And you have Benny Gantz saying, I want to compromise, I want to compromise. But actually, in the negotiations, he's not compromising because, listen, it's, it's putting the government in a terrible situation. And, it, it, and Likud is hemorrhaging support because most of the people in Likud, as you know, also want to compromise. Many people in the Likud. So it, it, it's, it's working to their benefit. One of the great changes, one of the dangerous changes Why in Israeli politics. I mean, just one last point in this, and I, I know we agree on this, that one of the great changes in Israeli politics over the last couple of years is that for the first time in our political history, Israeli politicians, 
Netanyahu, yes, but not just Netanyahu, have chosen partisan political interests over the national interests. And whether it be the, the vote as extending uh, Israeli law over the, the uh, Jewish settlements in uh, Judea and Samaria, or the which they could oppose, right, in order to bring down the government, or even voting down a piece of legislation that would have enabled the previous government, the Bennett government, to achieve the removal of uh, the visa, the visa right. waiver, which I used to say to my staff in Washington, if we ever achieved that, they'd make a big statue to us in downtown Dizengoff Square. Um, the Likud voted it down. And, and they did this, they put their partisan interests above state interests, but that's also what's happening in these negotiations. I, w I want to move on, but I, also, I feel like I have to ask you, I mean, you worked very closely with Prime Minister Netanyahu for four, four years, five ten, years? Ten. ten years. Great here. <laughs> this, why would he not want to compromise and get out of this mess and survive? Uh, or, or another way of asking that question is, isn't the guy you worked for and the guy I covered 10 years ago not this guy? Because that guy, I think, would so have I'm not, compromised. You know, I'm not in daily contact with this guy, but he seems from the outside to be very, very different. First of all, he's much weaker. Now, I had the privilege slash so is that the answer? He benefit of serving under two weaker? different governments, mm -hmm. two different Netanyahu governments, both of which are very stable, almost without and any, any coalition crises. This is 2009, 2013. 2015, 2015, 2019. It really, almost no crises, very stable governments. Uh, and this is one crisis after another, because he's weak. Netanyahu always wants to be in the center of his coalition. He wants to have parties to the right of him, the left of him. Now he finds himself the leftmost person in his own coalition. Uh, and he has guns to his head, multiple guns to his head. He's got settler guns, he's got Haredi guns, he's got all different types of he's guns, got a, and he has judicial he's got a trial. Got a trial, okay. much weaker. The suicide thing. <laughs> much, much weaker. And, uh, and, and, and I know, that may, uh, Jody, you may not like this, but it would, it would be in Israel's interest to have a much stronger Netanyahu uh, than we have right now. It would not be in, it would be in it, Israel's It would be, because I think that Netanyahu would, would always come out in favor decisions. of judicial review. It, was, it actually goes against his longstanding policies. Um, well, this actually brings me to the next question, yeah. which is, you know, we're sitting here like just a few blocks from where this parade was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And... It was not like other parades, as you may have either seen or read. Um, you know, protesters lining the route, Jewish organizations and rabbis shouting at Israeli ministers. And in many cases, those guys shouted back. We have this diaspora affairs minister who giving the middle finger. Maybe giving the middle finger. He seems completely well, uninterested yeah, in the diaspora, as far as I can tell. Um, we have Simcha Rothman, who sponsored the judicial overhaul legislation. And now Netanyahu is hired as his media advisor, no. a guy who thinks. And then he wants to know why he's not Trump invited to the White House. Won the 2020 election this? and thinks Joe Biden is destroying America. Yeah. So I feel like. One of the axioms, one of, but you, you have your guy who told you the axiom of Israeli politics. Yeah. One of the ones that I think you two taught me was that the relationship with America is so important, that politicians cannot win elections unless they are believed to be people who will do well in Washington. Is that, yeah. is that era over? I have a lot to say about this, but... Uh, giving us yeah. the finger. I mean... Well, look, if you look at the polls in, uh, in the last couple months, uh, in Israel, uh, if elections were held today, this government would lose overwhelmingly. Uh, I've never seen, maybe you have, I mean, in, I, I'm, I'm only in Israel 40 years, so I'm a newcomer. But, uh, <laughs> a green hog. A green hog. But uh, <laughs> I, um, I've never yeah. seen a, a government disintegrate in the polls as quickly as this government has. Yeah. And I think there are many reasons for it. And one of the many reasons is the... Uh, perception, the, the, the accurate perception, that uh, Netanyahu is leading us into a kind of pariah status. And, um, and, and certainly the fact that, uh, that the White House hasn't invited him uh, has registered with, with the Israeli public. Israelis don't like that. They don't li if, if we need to have a, a crisis with Washington for issues that, that we perceive as, as essential to our security, Israelis are ready to, to do that, but not over, not over a judicial transformation. Uh, so um, 
and, and, and Ben Gvir and Smotrich uh, have underwhelmed the Israeli public. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they have not been impressive, to, to say the least. And so, yeah, I, I think that this is, um, it's a coalition of scoundrels. That's, that's not to put too fine a word on it, but we have never had, this is a coalition. It's not the question you asked, but I have to say it. It's, uh, it's, it's a coalition that brings together the, the, the nationalist, the ultra-nationalist far right, religious fundamentalists, and the merely corrupt. <laughs> which, 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 is, which is the Likud. <laughs> and, and, and that's, we've never had a government like this. And, uh, and this so, is how you know Yossi's not a politician. He yeah. acknowledges that he's not answering the question. Right. <laughs> you have no idea. It comes to the rule. It's like the four, first rule of, of, of like, uh, with interviewing on CNN is that when they ask you a question, you say, that's a great question. And but a it, better question <laughs> would be. And, <laughs> the actual, at the New York right. Times. Baby is the master of that, isn't You're the master of it. It's called Bridget. Near, at yeah. the New York Times, when I first got there, yeah. someone taught me that if you wanted to get out of doing a story, you yeah. would just say, a smarter way of doing this. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Let me just add, listen, the tremendous amount, we can talk hours about the U.S.-Israel relationship. You know, Bibi built himself up by standing up to Barack Obama, all right? And, uh, there was no, no love loss there. I think the sense with Joe Biden is that Joe Biden is a genuine friend of Israel, and I, I know him right well, and I know his staff quite well, and he is a genuine friend. Um, and Israelis don't like seeing tensions between someone who they perceive as a genuine friend and not as a challenge. Um, I see also a strategic danger, and I, I think Yossi would agree with me on this, that as we are approaching a, a head-on collision with Iran, we need always essential services for the United States. The first one is replenishing our ammunition stocks, which we always run low in every conflict we have. Um, is the, who is going to, what I, who's going to provide what I call the diplomatic iron dome? Who's going to cast the veto in the Security Council when we're, we're condemned as war criminals for going into southern Lebanon to get Hezbollah missiles? Who's going to help us in the morning after? Um, this is an administration that has stood up consistently against its own progressive wing to defend and say that Israel has a right to defend itself. Really, under tremendous pressure. The uh, progressive wing does not like the administration's position on Israel. You know, they haven't reopened the consulate in East right. Jerusalem. They haven't pressured on settlements. They really haven't. Um, and um, there is a certain segment of the Israeli population that, is, that acknowledges this, that appreciates this, and does not appreciate the fact that there's tension between uh, our government and the White House. So you, we skated over a little bit the occupation. I'm going to take us back there for a sec. In the book you write, um, Michael, you write, the land of Israel, every last millimeter of it belongs to the state of Israel. Yes. Just a bold and blunt and the Jewish um, people, statement. Mm -hmm. um, and you go on to say that while Israel cannot, you say that the Israel cannot be seen as occupying the West Bank because that land, in your view, belongs to the Jewish people, and we can't occupy our own land, but you acknowledge that Israel is occupying another people, the Palestinian mm -hmm. people, and should stop doing that. I also say that, that we, we own every millimeter, because the right, for example, of you know, Tammy to me and me to live in Jaffa is the same right that someone has to live in Ariel or, or Beit El. It's that we either have a right to the land of Israel or we don't. But I go on to say on the next page, that doesn't mean you have to actualize that right in every situation. You're not going to build settlements in downtown Ramallah and Janine. And uh, this, by the way, is the longest chapter in the book has to do with the peace process, because I started uh, 30 years ago in the Robin years in the Oslo process, and I concluded being an advisor to the Trump peace plan. So I come with a perspective. I also participated in the last round of negotiations with the Palestinians, which is, I probably learned more. You'll see in the book those. that Michael is the Forrest yeah. Gump of the Jewish people. He, <laughs> that's he, a lie. I know that's your lie, but I can't look at it myself. But right. every chapter is that. like, when I was doing this <laughs> was, important <laughs> thing related to this tenant. When I was sitting with Moshe Rabbeinu, and he was deciding whether, you know, Canada or Canaan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, but that's the I said, movie version, you'll be Forrest Gump. But I also say that, that, that this should be also our position in negotiations. We should come to the table the same way the Palestinians come to the table. They say they own every millimeter too. We shouldn't come to the negotiating table and say, hey, you guys say you own it all, but we only own half. Um, I, in the, in the book, the longest chapter deals with the question of two states. And I have a lot to say about it. At a certain level, I think it's a moot point because there are two states. 
Uh, you go up Highway 6 and you see big Palestinian flags flying over to Karm and Kalkilia. There's a state there. It's not necessarily a Weberian sovereign state, but it's got a government, not standing for re-election. It's got a, a military of sorts that collects taxes, uh, mostly at gunpoint. And um, you know, it, it is the state. The question is, what is the territorial and juridical extent of that state? And what is our ability to defend ourselves against that state? That's a huge issue. So I was yeah. going to say that before you go, you say, I just wanted to share something you told me nine, ten years ago, which relates similar to what Michael wrote in the book. But you said it in this incredibly poetic way. It was, um, at, it was at a moment during the Kerry negotiations, which most of us have forgotten, um, when Abbas, President Abbas, went on Israeli television to say he understood that he would never go back to Safed, which is where his family is from. And you said to me, you said that that was very meaningful to you, mm -hmm. um, and that you understood that that was him giving something up, and that you appreciated the idea that he was personally giving something up and was asking his people to give something up, and that you believed, as Michael wrote, that the West Bank also belongs to the Jewish people and to you, and that you are eager to give it up for a two-state solution, but you want the Palestinians to acknowledge that you are also giving something up that you believe belongs to you. Um, Can I unpack that quote that I gave you? Sure. Because <laughs> no. um, he just backtracked a couple weeks ago. I, I just want to give you <laughs> he a He just took it back. I want to give you a very different Mahmoud quote. Abbas. Uh, yeah. Okay, sure. I'm yeah, happy. Yeah. Ball, exactly. He Abbas. Just, just no, took it back. He, uh, look, Abbas walked that that concession back a few days after he made it. Ah. And, uh, and, and I remember feeling completely deflated. Um, I, I, was very, I was very moved when he, he was asked by an Israeli journalist, you were born in Tzfat, Safed, uh, which is in, the, in, the, in northern Israel, in the Galil. Uh, does, does Tzfat belong to you, to the Palestinians? And he said, Tzfat is part of the state of Israel. He said, I, I, I hope that I will have the right to visit, but it's part of the state of Israel. There was such an a outcry within Palestinian society that he felt impelled to walk it back, which, of course, in that little story, it tells you everything that's gone wrong in Palestinian politics. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, I would not say that I'm, I'm eager to give up Judea and Samaria, and for me, as as well, for you're you, here to end the conflict, and yes, you know that it. I, I, I would be prepared under certain circumstances, and I should just add parenthetically that for me, as for most Israelis, it's not the West Bank, and it's certainly not occupied territory. It's Judea and Samaria, and that's uh, no wait, 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 wait. Before you applaud, there's more. There's more. Yeah. Where I go farther um, than than you would be willing to is I say yes, every inch of, the, of, of the, the land between the river and the sea belongs to the Jewish people. The problem is that it also belongs to the Palestinian people. Inclu no, stop, stop, stop. No. It's, not a, it's not a political rally. I don't disagree and, with you. I so, I the real question is and, how do right. we get out of this mess? You, so, both, you both, I mean, you both say he's, he's Israel will not I, I'm survive. Just an an analyst. Israel will not survive with, with this status quo. It's not, I don't say it as a politician. You know, this is get, being involved in this process for 30 years at different levels, mm -hmm. and it's this. I, you mentioned John Kerry. So I remember John Kerry's the more gray hair. Um, <laughs> I used to say to John Kerry, I said, our problem is not that the Palestinians are not a people. Our problem is that the Palestinians are not enough of a people. There are thousands of peoples in the world. Very, very few of them are capable of sustaining a nation state structure. In the last 140 years, I cannot point to any evidence. I cannot adduce a single shred of evidence that would suggest that the Palestinians are, are capable of sustaining a state structure. On the contrary, much, much as is to the contrary. One of the great miracles one of the great achievements of the state of Israel, you can take Jews from seven different countries in the world who don't have a common language, don't have a common culture, stick them in a country with no natural resources, no, surrounded by adversaries, they're gonna create a nation state and a high functioning nation state. You stick you know, Palestinians in Gaza, you're gonna get Gaza. And that is a real problem for us. If they're more of a people, if they have more of that sense of cohesion, they could do much better. It's a problem, we could create a Palestinian state tomorrow, it's gonna to fall apart. Michael, believe, you might be right, you might be right. Yeah. But we have the responsibility, if only to ourselves, to, to 
do everything we can Absolutely. to try to make a viable Palestinian state possible. And please, no applause from the left side. Right, of, right, uh, right, right. Um, what, what, what I look for in a, in a, in a Jewish audience uh, is, um, is nuance, is an appreciation of just how complicated and how heartbreaking the situation is. And uh, it's, 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 so, it's so much beyond the left-right oh. divide that, uh, that we really need to have serious conversations about, about what, what this is doing to us. And look, you know, for, for many years I felt that we can't continue with the occupation. There must be a Palestinian state. And like Michael has just laid out, there can't be a Palestinian state. And right. so what do you do? Well, That's right. the tragedy. So I, my, my son, Noam, is here, was in, in the Army in a special forces unit. We have my assistant, uh, Ben, who got injured uh, battling protests in, in Judea and Samaria in the Nahal. We have to be able to look at these young people in the eye and say that we tried everything. Yeah. Because they're, they're, we're asking them to go out and risk their lives. <clears throat> and, and that's no small thing. But my point in the book is that as we keep beating our heads on the two-state solution, which is neither a solution, and the Palestinians actually have never accepted the American form of the two states for two peoples because they don't recognize us as a people. Look at Mahmoud Abbas's- the, Jew, the Jewish people. The Jewish right. people. They never accepted us as Jewish people. Look at Mahmoud Abbas's recent speech in the UN where he denied there's a Jewish people, and denied there was ever a temple. There's no evidence at all that there was ever a Jewish temple. That's what he said to the UN a couple of weeks ago. No evidence at all. Um, and you know, we, we have to be able to look at other, there are alternatives. There's autonomy, there's trusteeship, there is cantonment. There are different ways you can approach this. I know even people in this administration are thinking the same thing, that we've been beating our heads on this formula for, two, for, this for 30 years, this administration, for 30 years. It's not going anywhere, nor is it gonna go anywhere, mm. not the least of which because of an Israeli government that's adamantly opposed to it. You have no Israeli, Palestinian leadership, no, there's no one to negotiate on either side right now. Uh, so let's look at different ways that we can address the situation. Is yeah, the it a solution? <laughs> no. Is it a better way of, uh, of managing? Absolutely. Well, is it, and is it a way to preserve Israel as a Jewish state? Yes, no state? question. So I'm excited right. to report from the nuance front that we have some very good audience questions. So thank you for these. I'm gonna turn to these. Um, and aw, you guys are so We love good. each other. We we do. Do. We're gonna get we back to each other. you <laughs> and your friendship in a second. But well, um, I think this, huh. Might be for Yossi. Um, how can the democracy movement be fully inclusive of Arab citizens when, amongst other things, they may not be comfortable raising, waving the Israeli flag? And of course, we've had question. many a, smart things written about the lack of Arab involvement. Yeah. So yes, thank you for the question. How, how could you and Look, your fellow and, and the, the the question, is, the dilemma is even sharper because uh, some Arab Israelis want to come with Palestinian flags. And that's not really welcome uh, in, uh, in our demonstrations. Now, because we're, we're liberals, nobody's going to tell them not to fly a flag. And you come to our demonstrations, yeah. you'll see there are a few Palestinian flags on the edges. And Netanyahu, um, in the early uh, phase of the demonstrations, really went to town on these flags. He tweeted out, he said, here, this is the opposition, meaning that we're all traitors. And the, the, the grassroots response, the, literally the next week, was people showing up with thousands of giant Israeli flags, and that became the symbol. So, so the problem- I mean, but frankly, this isn't just a problem of this movement. This is the, one of the fundamental problems in the book that's about the fundamental challenge of what Israel's gonna be. It is, right. but what, what I find so moving and powerful about this movement is precisely that it is an uprising of the Israeli center. It's not an uprising of the, of the left. The left is there, but there's very little left left in the state of Israel. Mm. And, and instead, what you have, it, this is a movement that's led by soldiers. Every living former IDF commander in chief is part of this movement. Yeah. I believe there are yeah. eight of them. Every former head of the Mossad, except for one, Yossi Cohen, is, is, is part of this movement. And even he, even he signed, came out. He signed came out the too. letter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, every former head of the Shin Bet 
is active. These are the people who speak every week around the country. At well, and of course, the defense minister. Yeah. I, not, I, I want to respond to the Arab issue. The issue if okay. I yes, but, 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 but right. so, okay. so first of all, we have, to own, we have to own up to the fact, and proudly, that this is a Zionist movement. The language of this movement is Zionist. And, and that's so important because the government tried to de-Zionize us to appropriate Zionism for themselves, we didn't let them do it. Mm -hmm. The dilemma here, and I, and I understand why Arab Israelis would feel uncomfortable surrounded by thousands of Israeli flags. I find that heartbreaking, but I understand why they would feel uncomfortable. Um, in the same way that I would not be part of a demonstration with, with with massive Palestinian Well, I mean, flags. again, this, is, this really is about the, the, one of the core challenges mm. of the state. I mean, I, you, you talk in your book, Michael, about w how the importance of having Arab representation on the Supreme Court. But I know for me, it was one of the, the indelible lessons of these challenges to, when, you know, the Arab, to be a Supreme Court justice mm. who doesn't stand for your own country's, um, or doesn't say your own country's national anthem is like, Exposing the, the challenge at the core. We have a third of, of our country. members of Knesset will not just sing the national anthem. <laughs> not just Arabs. There's also Haredim. A lot of people won't sing the national yeah, anthem. Well, then Imagine like a third of the Congress not singing Star Spangled Banner. Um, anyway, uh, go quickly <laughs> on Arab Israelis because the next <laughs> question for you. But is I want really to go good. to. I want to express. Uh, respond to you and then respond to Yossi. Okay, if I can. It's, um, one is that there's a chapter in the book that what I call the the New Deal, uh, and the New Deal is basically that the state of Israel has to declare as a national goal, um, total equality between uh, Arabs and Jews. And that means fighting, in a Churchillian sense, uh, discrimination in, in the classroom and in the, in the, in the workplace, uh, certainly in the halls of government. But there's the quid pro quo, that the Arab population of Jews and the Palestinian population of Jews in Israel has to acknowledge its legitimacy of a Jewish nation state and be loyal to that state. And I give many examples of you know, of the 194 nations in the world, majority are nation states. They have non-nation uh, minorities who are very loyal. The good example would be Anglo Jewry, uh, which uh, salutes a flag that has not one but three crosses on it, and uh, sings "God Save the Queen" to the head or the, the queen, the king now, uh, to the head of the Church of England, and is willing to fight for that flag and die for that flag. Okay, so Israeli Arabs can can salute our flag as well. Um, so that's, that's the New Deal, and I think that, that that's one of, the real, one of the reasons I put the, the book, a third of the book in Arabic, was just to show that hey, this is 21% of our, our population, we can't ignore them, they're part of our story. I talk about bringing the Arabs into the Israeli story, because every, of course, nation, we are a story, and our story has proven very flexible. We've brought Druze into our story, we've brought Circassians into our story, uh, Ethiopian Jews into our story, there's room for the Arabs in our story too. Um, now, to what Yossi's caught, and this is gonna be a little bit edgy, and that is, you know, we started off, I think the, the protests reached about 700,000 people. Uh, as of this week, they're down to about 150, a little bit le lesser, um, because it's fragmenting uh, in some of its goals. Um, we cannot ignore the fact that even when 700,000 people are out protesting, there were 9.3 million people not protesting. And who are these people? They deserve a voice as well. I live in, we live in different places. I live in, in South Tel Aviv and a member of a community that is overwhelmingly Mizrahi. They see it completely different. They don't see it as a matter of democracy and rights and freedom. They see it as a battle over white privilege. That the, the people, most of the people protesting, certainly in Tel Aviv, and I've seen the protests in Tel Aviv, are Ashkenazi, uh, elite upper class, and they are rallying around the last bastion of Ashkenazi uh, elite power, which is the Supreme Court. And they refuse to relinquish the power that they lost at the polls, which is to working class, traditional uh, Mizrahi population. Uh, they see it in those terms. And, um, you know, well, the term, I know you disagree <laughs> with that, but that, this is, I hear this, on a, I hear it throughout my building, I hear it throughout my neighborhood, daily. daily. I have see always been different. sympathetic to, to, that, to, yeah. to that argument. I, I made Aliyah into the Mizrahi revolution in the early 80s and very much identified with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that the Likud has manipulated this issue, has manipulated the ethnic issue, and this is a, a at this moment, this is a contrived issue. What we are, what we're fighting for is, uh, is whether modern successful Israel is going to, to survive. 
and uh, whether, whether young Israelis uh, who are part of the successful side of the state will feel that they have a future in the country. That's what this is about. There are Mizrahim who are part of this demonstration. Maybe it's a, it's a, it is a majority Ashkenazi, but you have a strong uh, minority of Mizrahim uh, who are part of this. If you look at the speakers uh, every week, the speakers are heavily Ashkenazi, uh, Mizrahi, uh, also religious. You have, you have religious Jews. Okay, I gotta move on. And so, you know, this is, but this is really a, a for me, this is a, a, it's a contrived issue, and, it, and Michael, it's, it's... Don't say that in my neighborhood. They may no, take offense at that. Okay, but people have been, <laughs> okay. mani people have been <laughs> manipulated by this government. Okay, we have more good questions. And also, can I get... I need a time check. Should I... Do oh, I, let's just keep going. Okay, let's just we're keep going. Fun. Okay, <laughs> as an you American... You guys are okay, we're okay. This is what? a question from the audience. As yeah. an American Jew, how can I reconcile the idea of a vibrant liberal democracy with Israel's refusal to provide defensive weapons to Ukraine, Ooh. particularly Iron Dome. That's a good That's question for you. That's for, you. Yeah. That's I know. for me. It's right up so your last, you know, <laughs> you know, if you go on Israeli television, it's very different than American television. You, know, you go on, like, Meet the Press here. It's my distinguished you colleagues I, across the aisle. You did a story together about that in 2014. What was what? Where you talked about when you were interviewed on American television and Israeli television. Yeah, you go on Israeli television. They, they, oh, really? they, you start to talk and everyone screams at you. And they curse you at live television. So this is now a year ago last February, a couple, maybe a week after the invasion, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. I get on Israeli television on a panel, and I said, you know, Israel has to come out unequivocally on the side of, of uh, Ukraine. It's a strategic interest for the state of Israel. It's a moral interest for the state of Israel. We are the Jewish democratic state, and how can we remain neutral, which was our position back then, while a fellow democracy, led by a Jew, uh, was invaded by a totalitarian state. And it was also our interest, keeping our interest, you know, the fact that we are part of the Western world. We're part of, we're part of the enlightened free world. We're part of, we are the ally of the United States of America. And some of our good friends here were very, very angry with us. Um, and the reasons that given, I didn't buy the reasons that were given. The reason was that we were afraid of the Russians uh, in Syria, who enable us to, our army and our air force, to attack uh, Iranian installations in Syria. And we were afraid the Russians would shoot at our forces. And I thought, well, listen, there are only 4,000 Russians in, in Syria. Now there's only 1,000. Uh, and we have an army that's more than twice as large as the British and French armies combined. The fact that we were broadcasting to our enemies that we were afraid of 4,000 Russian soldiers was a bad message. All right. Why are, we, why are we afraid? Uh, let them be afraid. So I was very adamant about it, and everybody screamed at me. How could you endanger Israeli lives? How could you care about the Ukrainians who were, you know, this is the, the cradle of anti-Semitism in Europe. People assaulted me on the street, you don't know, for saying this. Um, what is it now, a year and a half later, I feel exactly the same. Um, and I think that, that we'll have a reconcile, there'll be, there'll be a, we will have to answer to history if we don't come out um, squarely on the side of the Ukrainians. And yes, we should be providing Iron Dome. And we should be providing early warning systems. We should be providing cyber capabilities to the Ukrainians. I don't know whether they're going to win or not. To me, you know, in terms of Israel, we have to be able to look ourselves in the mirror and say that we did everything to help this country. And uh, by the way, the Ukrainians living in Israel Russians are not pro-Putin. Right. It's interesting. You'd think that, that, no, not at all. And the people I got the most support from were for the Russians and the Ukrainians in Israel. You mentioned, Michael, the way in which the Biden administration is sort of staving off the progressive wing of the Democratic mm -hmm. Party related to Israel. But this, so this questioner says, can Israel survive in spite of American Jewry and its move to the progressive left? Yost. Which is a Yossi question, <laughs> but I want to, you can answer I'll this question. I'll ask about question. Ukraine. You asked about American Jew. You can answer this question, <laughs> but I'd also like to have a twist to it, which yeah. is, so it, they're asking, can, can Israel survive in spite of American Jewry and its moves to the progressive left? And I would ask you to also think about whether there's any way in which that move is helping Israel, is helping the debate, is helping the keep people mm. honest. Look, I'm worried about two things in, in, in the future of the, uh, Israeli-American Jewish relationship, and, and, and I'm not worried principally about the impact on Israeli security, about a lessening of American Jewish support. My, my concern is coming out of a Klal Yisrael uh, commitment, the commitment to the Jewish people. It's a Jewish people issue. It's not an issue about Israeli security, first and foremost. 
I think Israel will, will, will survive if, if, if we manage to remain an intact society, will survive. That's the, that's the existential threat. It's, right. it's, it's Iran, we can handle Iran, we can handle a, a reduction in American support. I, I don't want it to happen, but we can, we can deal with that. What worries me about the, the viability, the long-term viability of the American-Jewish-Israeli relationship is what's happening to American Jews and what's happening to Israelis. Um, if you think of the two flags on the bima of most American synagogues, those two flags represent a, a statement that, that Israel as a, as a Jewish state, as a democratic state, uh, is, is compatible with the values that American Jews hold. Now, what we're doing on both sides of the relationship is starting to unravel the two flags, the entwinement of Jewish state and democratic state. Uh, in, uh, in America, more and more young Jews, and not only young Jews, uh, so on, on the left, are beginning to feel squeamish about a Jewish state. Is this really, is, this, is it democratic, is it legitimate? They're starting to, there is a growing movement of, of renouncing what was a, a fundamental given in, for, for three generations of American Jews. And on the Israeli side, we're seeing a rise of a repudiation of Israel as a democratic state. It's still not a majority, it's still, it's, but it's not a fringe anymore either. It's a growing minority that, it, that repudiates that sees democracy as a burden. Here we are surrounded by enemies, mm -hmm. and this is the Ben Gvir appeal. Democratic norms hamper our ability to defend ourselves. The Supreme Court is holding back the IDF, which is, which is generally not true, by the mm -hmm. way. But uh, what worries me is, is that if, if, if we begin to renounce Israel as a, as a democratic state, and American Jews begin turning from Israel as a Jewish state, then we have nothing left in common. There's no shared language. Mm. And those two flags are not long for the world either. I, I see it um, not as a strategic question, but as a moral question. Um, again, 10 years ago, I came back from Washington and I met with, uh, with our leaders and I, I said, I got some bad news for you. The bad news is we're on our own. This is not the America you knew. You know, in 1982, I was in the siege of Beirut as a younger paratrooper, and we all knew that if Israel got into a bad scrape, Reagan would send the Marines to get us out, and he did, twice. The Marines aren't coming anymore. Not America, after Afghanistan, Iraq, is gonna be focusing on itself. It's not gonna wanna be the policeman of the world. It can't even figure out how to police itself. And we're on our own. And I said, this is bad news, but it's also, we're not the same country we were. We're strong, we can stand on our own two feet. Uh, and I think now, you know, 10 years later, that, that bad news, again, has, has, has percolated throughout our consciousness. And we understand that America is not what it was during, you know, the Reagan years, the Clinton years. It's, it's going to be different. And so the question is whether Israel can survive without American Jewry. The question is America can survive without America. There aren't American Jewry. So that's a strategic issue. The moral issue, and I think Yossi's touching on it, is that what is Israel's responsibility as the self-proclaimed nation state of the Jewish people. What does that mean? We say it all the time, but we don't unpack it. Are we, do we have an obligation to, for Jewish continuity, Jewish education? Um, do we have a responsibility, as I say in the book, to recognize the legitimacy of the reform and conservative movement? By the way, it's a rather controversial position I took because really nobody, even the previous government didn't support that position, by the way, recognizing the reform and conservative movement. The fourth is that, that we are the nation state of the Jewish people, irrespective of how people practice or choose not to practice their Judaism, if you're part of our people. And we're not fulfilling that role. We're not now. Uh, it's not just a matter of democracy, Yossi, it's a matter of Jewish peoplehood. Yes. And uh, so the moral question is much bigger here. Yeah. Right, and if, if Israel is not the nation state of the Jewish people, or if yeah. the American Jewish people cannot relate to the Israel that exists, then everything else kind of comes out the window about all the thing, all the justifications for things or whatever. Well, then we're a Mediterranean state that yeah, just happens to be nice. Jewish. Yeah. Okay, when it, that changes our historical 
our historical mission. We set out to create the nation state of the Jewish people, and it certainly right. exists that way in Israeli law. The question is, does this Israeli practice? Bear in mind that the yeah. threat that this government poses to Jewish peoplehood is that this is the first government that believes that Israel is the state of Judaism and not necessarily the state of the Jewish people. And the state of the Jewish people means the whole mess of the Jewish people. Yeah. And, and that there isn't any one particular version of Judaism that the state of Israel will, will, will enshrine. Now, of course, there's, that's, that's not a true statement because we have an orthodox chief rabbinate. Yeah. But the counter to the orthodox chief rabbinate is the law of return. The law of return is an anti-orthodox law. And the orthodox communities in Israel have been trying desperately for years mm. to amend it. This government is going to try to amend the law of return. And that, I think, is the next great fight. After we fight over democracy, what, what is, is, is democratic Israel? The next fight is what, what is, is Jewish, Jewish Israel. Israel. Yeah. Mm. OK, I'm going to ask one more of these great audience questions. I like and that. Then I like that. I wrote like it. it. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I'm going to steal that. We steal from each other all the time. That's mine now. <laughs> so this is a good uh, well, talk uh, about gay rights in Israel now. It's Pride Month. We'll do yeah, just a sure. quick, a quick one on that. That's a Michael question now. No, no. I just you know we we pride we've prided. This is not you know plan where we've prided ourselves for many years of being a, you know a leader in uh, in gay rights. Um, and as an ambassador, I did a, a lot in that field. Um, we do not have gay marriage because we don't have civil marriage. Um, and uh, civil marriage doesn't exist anywhere in the Middle East. And by the way, the biggest opponents of civil marriage in Israel would be, would be the imams and the priests. Uh, yeah, I remember there like a, a great uh, story a colleague of mine did about, yeah. you know, in Cyprus where all mm. the Israelis go to get married, mm. also all the Lebanese go. And so yeah, they, they meet, meet each other, they, they talk. <laughs> I saw, remember that story, it's a great story. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, that's going to be a, another front. It's going to be, you know, the, whether whether, you so know, whether it, Israel can remain that type of liberal society, you given know. the increasing religious hegemony I mean, I, of the government. I live in I live in the Israeli state. He lives in the Jewish state. He lives in Jerusalem, and uh, in the Israeli state, is the, the, of Tel Aviv was considered the most gay-friendly city in the world. And this week, there's going to be 250,000 people. It's great for the hotel business too, um, and, so, and that's that. And then we we do this with pride. Does that mean there are not challenges? There's going to be challenges, and there's going to be more challenges. Uh, there are going to be more challenges. So I think I think we're going to close um, with uh, this question, which is sort of a question, sort of a topic, which is: I, I, you talk in your book about Israeliness mm -hmm. and what that means to you, and I'm I'm interested in hearing. Uh, what it means to both of you, but I want to ask that by way of thinking about your own journeys. Like, so you each grew up uh, not far from here, uh, in two different directions, and in two, in two different, different centuries, in two, <laughs> two, two different planets. I grew up in the 19. I grew up in northern New Jersey. I could see Brooklyn from where I grew up, and uh, but I grew up in 1950s um, happy days. He grew up in 17th century Brooklyn. So, Poland, Poland. Poland. This, was, this, was really, this was this was pre cool old Brooklyn. Right. My son is here. Right. And, uh, and uh, it's he's, great that both he's a, yeah, you're he's like a, he's a jazz a jazz drummer in Brooklyn. Yeah. There were no jazz drummers in the Brooklyn that I grew up in. <laughs> Um, uh, even your old neighborhood is getting hip now, you see. But, um, and then you both made Aliyah not all that far apart from each right. other. And um, each of you has traveled some distance politically. Um, and you've become best friends. And you speak multiple times a day and edit each other's writing and all this stuff. So I don't know. Just I'd love to hear what you talk about. What, what does Israeliness mean to you? And also this oh, little right. roadshow you have going mm -hmm. here, this little friendship. The overwhelming word for me is gratitude, mm -hmm. just gratitude. And, and gratitude to be part of a generation, even that has to deal with the most excruciating consequences of Jewish sovereignty. And it's, it's, it's an endless source of, of, uh, of wonder for me to be alive at this moment as a Jew. And, and I can never for a moment take it for granted. And, um, and so gratitude, wonder, um, frustration, agony, 
it's all of those. It's, it's, it's so alive, <laughs> you know? There's nothing neutral or indifferent about being an Israeli. And I signed up for the roller coaster. And I knew exactly what I was getting into because I made Aliyah at the beginning of the this first Lebanon war, the summer of 1982, when Michael was in Beirut. I was filing my immigration papers. And, and that was the first war that Israel lost, and, it, and we lost it because we were totally divided over that war. And so I, I was making Aliyah into a society that was tearing itself apart. And I'm very glad that I did, because I, 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 I couldn't afford illusions. My illusion, my, all of my starry-eyed Zionism, uh, had, I, I had to leave it uh, at the airport because the Israel that I was entering was tearing itself apart. And, um, and so the Israel of today that I, it really brings me back 40 years. And, and, and in, in some ways, it's even more, more painful now. But I feel emotionally able to deal with it because I knew what I was signing up for and because the stakes are so high and because of what I owe Israel. What I owe Israel personally, I feel that Israel healed me as a Jew. I grew up, you know, you alluded to the political journeys that we came, that Michael and I came, we came from very opposite places. Michael came from Hashomer Atzair, which was the far left of the Zionist movement. I came from Beitar and then the Jewish Defense League, which was of course the far right. And, and what I feel Israel did for me was really, you know, Zionism promised that it would normalize the Jews. I feel the state of Israel normalized me. As, I know what Michael would say to that. But <laughs> <laughs> as, as normal, as normal as it's all relative. Right. But I do feel that, that where I started from as this traumatized son of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a survivor family and, and a very angry, an angry son of survivors and seeing the whole non-Jewish world as enemy, Israel healed me. And, and so what I owe the state of Israel, I feel like I, I'm, I was an emotional refugee, even though I was coming from New York City. I was, I, I, I was a psychological refugee. And uh, in the same way that the state of Israel healed one wave after another of traumatized refugees, I, I feel that I was healed in, 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 in a similar way. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Gratitude is the overwhelming sense I have. Um, I moved to Israel in the 1970s. There was nothing. <laughs> you know, there was, uh, to call home to America, you had to take these huge bags of these metal tokens, a simonim, and sit there for hours at a pay phone. And, and uh, you could speak to your parents maybe once a month for $100 for five minutes. Um, there was nothing. There was no food. Even the the falafel was bad. Um, <laughs> white cheese and yellow cheese. <laughs> that's, like, that's right, white cheese, yellow cheese, that's what you had. Uh, Noodles that turned yellow in the water when yeah, they yeah. boiled. It was nothing. It was nothing. You had no central heating. That was the thing. You had to go out with two jerry cans down to the, to the gas station it's and the fill desert. them up what to come mean? back and light a little <laughs> stove and hang over the stove. It was just, you know. And I was a lone soldier and I, there wasn't any hot water. You used to shower. You didn't shower in the army. You, came, you, you, you showered every three weeks when you came home, but there wasn't enough hot water to wash you and your uniform. Uniforms. So I'd stick them all in the bathtub and then get into the bathtub with my uniforms and go like this. Okay? <laughs> that was Israel in the 1970s. And you turn great, around. Great music. There was so great I want, music. I want to talk, it was great, but, but we're talk, let's talk about the music because your music is so important to you. I adore Israeliness. I, I adore even you know, the people who won't let you pass them on the highway because then they're a friar. Okay, if you pass on the highway, um, that type of Israeliness doesn't drive you crazy. We um, have forged a nation. We forged a nation out of, in, in the face of impossible odds, out of vastly disparate peoples. Um, and I think above all, we have assumed responsibility for ourselves. And I, someone always, you know, someone says define Zionism. And Zionism has one word. It's a synonym. It's called responsibility. Israel is the one place where Jews, where we can take responsibility for ourselves. We're responsible for the electricity. We're responsible for the sewers. We're responsible for the mess of our governments. We're responsible. And I adore the responsibility. I look around me at people who agree with me, disagree with me, 
people yell at me on the street because of Ukraine, and they say, we are all assuming responsibility in a way that Jews have not been able to respond for 2,000 years. And, and Jews, frankly, anywhere else in the world cannot assume those responsibilities to the same way. I grew up during the Vietnam period. You grew up during the Vietnam period. Do we know anybody who fought in Vietnam? <laughs> no. Do we know anybody who hasn't fought in the state of Israel? Do we know anybody who hasn't lost loved ones fighting for the state of Israel in one way or the other? It's all part of the responsibility. Responsibility can be very painful. I, many of you are parents. You know what this feels like, right? That's responsibility. To me, it's the, it, it is the ultimate schut. It's the ultimate privilege. It's the ultimate bracha. It's the ultimate blessing to live in an era in which we can take responsibility for ourselves. And not just anywhere, but in our homeland, which has to be said, and the music, and the food is outrageous today. So. <laughs> they have culinary tours of Israel. Whoever thought of culinary tours of Israel? That's crazy. You know, um, we do it. And yes, it's painful. It can be. But it's beautiful pain, too. It is. Mm. Well, thank you both very much. It's been a privilege to you. join you for your daily conversations. Um, Michael is signing right, these you. books. Somewhere yeah. out there, I guess. Well, you know thank, I, I thank you to the, to the 2048 NGO, which is here. Eliovitz is over there. Say hello, Eliovitz. If you have questions about supporting 2048, the, our goal is to get a national and international conversation going about our future and to address these questions. So come and join us. All right, that was good. Mm.